This is what we're called to do. Uh, I believe that was co uh, accomplished then. Now, the reason I said all that was that this Africa trip in February, uh, that's the objective of that trip, is to secure these 20 plus regional leaders plus the uh, 10 or more each that they will raise up as forerunners and messengers that will be highlighted and identified during this trip to secure them as vessels. The Lord has given uh, this fellowship, uh, and I believe online you are partners in that, have given us the assignment not only for this house to be a, a forerunner vessel, but to raise up that same vessel in Africa. Uh, and so that's what we'll be doing in February. So it's a uh, significant assignment. Uh, it's not cheap because we have to not only pay our own way over there, we have to uh, facilitate bringing the pastors into a local general, uh, one central location and all the costs associated with that. So anyway, I've said all that to really encourage everybody here as well to just pray about what God would have you to give and to pledge but also those of you who are watching online. I know that we've heard so many testimonies of how you've been blessed by Pastor Brian's uh, teaching and, um, in, in uh, this house. Uh, and, you know, we want to take that blessing uh, to these pastors in Africa who, ha who aren't able to, uh, to, to hear and aren't able to uh, have access to some of the Internet and all the different things. There. So anyway, we want to encourage you to give. For those watching online, you can give online at give.lifeschoolinternational.org. Give.lifeschoolinternational.org. And I'll have a few more things at the end logistically to say to this fellowship about the tournament itself. But uh, even here in this house, I just want to challenge each of you to pray and ask what the Lord would have you to give and to participate in that. So, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Associate Pastor Ken and fellow elder. Yeah, anytime he calls me Pastor Brian, he's going to be, he's going to get an associate pastor. Anytime you call me Pastor Brian, you're going to get sheep, whatever your name is, sheep Angie. So, <clears throat> anyway, so I want to start here by since it's been about, it's been about a, a month or so since we looked at the indwelling life teaching, we want to pick back. I'm on, I want to review here just real quick kind of what we've been focused on recently, and we've been really geared into the aspect of renewing the mind. Very important. The renewing the mind is hugely important. And so what I want to do is just to start us off here is I want to I wanna just do a quick review of what we've looked at so far, um, not in the whole class, but as it relates to renewing the mind, because uh, very important that we, that we understand what renewing the mind does and the vital importance of renewing the mind. If you don't renew your mind, you're going to live in the soul, you're going to live in the flesh, and you're not going to be able to please the Lord. Renewing the mind is the way you get into the spirit. <clears throat> and so just want to start off with Romans 12, verse 2. Paul was talking and he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, <clears throat> and perfect. When Paul was writing in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when he says, Don't but be transformed, that word transformed is metamorphu in the Greek, which means metamorphosis. And so what happens is when you renew your mind, you, you experience a metamorphosis. You change states. See, you are, a, you, are, you are like the caterpillar. who You are the butterfly trapped in a caterpillar's body. When you begin to renew your mind, you, be, you change states from being in the flesh to being in the spirit. And so renewing the mind is how you experience that transformation. How do you, how do you people will always want to know, how do you walk in the spirit? How do you get out of the flesh? Well, the, the clearest thing in scripture, it's very clear, is you get out of the flesh by renewing your mind. 
by changing your thinking, by, ch by meditation. And we spent, you know, four, three or four weeks talking about that. Renewing the mind is what brings that metamorphosis to you of changing states. And Paul talked about that in Ephesians chapter 4, 22 through 24, that, that he said, put off the old man that is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit and put on the new man which has, been, which has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And how did he say to do that? He said to do it by renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And so renewing the mind is not trying in your own effort to try and bring about transformation. There's already been a transformation that's taken place in your spirit. Renewing your mind is coming into agreement with what God has already done in your spirit when you were born again so that that part of you that has been saved, that part of you that is now righteous, that part of you that is now holy, that part of you that is now like Jesus Christ, that part of you that is now one with the Holy Spirit, that that part of you would begin to rise up and that old man in Adam would begin to decrease. That he in you would increase and you would decrease by the renewing of the mind. It's not trying to produce transformation in your own power. It's not behavior modification. It is changing your thinking to realize your position in Christ, your condition in Christ, and who Christ is in you. And when you think upon that, you begin to change. See, your meditation determines your orientation. Your meditation determines your orientation. Whether you live from the spirit, the soul, or the body. If you're living in the flesh, I'll tell you exactly why. It's because your mind is set on the flesh. If you're living in the spirit, I'll tell you why. It's because your mind is set on the spirit. Whatever your mind is set upon is going to be the state you live in. You're either going to be carnal or spiritual based upon your meditation, based upon your thinking, based upon what your mind is revolving around. Does that make sense? It's so important. It's so important that we already have everything we need. You listen, you have everything you need to, for life and godliness is already inside of you. You don't need more. You need more released. God has already put everything you need for life and godliness inside of you in the person of Jesus Christ by his spirit. You don't need God to drop more down from heaven for you to walk in love or walk in joy or walk in peace. You have everything you need for life and godliness because your human spirit is joined to the Holy Spirit, the indwelling spirit, God who is the Holy Spirit. God himself lives inside of you and faith and believing and coming into alignment with that reality is what releases the life of God in you out so that Christ himself dwells in your heart by faith. See, Christ dwells in your heart by faith. See, when we don't believe, even though Christ is in us, we don't when we don't believe he's in us and we don't activate that faith, he will be dormant. The powerful, the all-powerful God who lives inside of you, spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection, will lie dormant within you and suppressed within you when you don't believe what he says about you, who he says is in you, your position in Christ, and your condition in Christ. And so meditation draws that out. Meditation draws that out. And what we said about meditation is meditation is thinking about, pondering, voicing. Remember, meditation cannot just be thought. Meditation has to be voiced, singing, speaking, writing. It can't just be um, you're, you're thinking. Now, it involves that, but it also has to be voiced. Meditation is when the truth of God's Word, the truth of God's Word goes from a page, or in this case, iPad, goes from the iPad, an app, or a page, onto your heart. And the very revelation Paul had when he wrote the Scriptures, and the very revelation Peter and John had when he wrote the Scriptures, that very revelation 
is then put into your heart and the word written on the page is now written on your heart and the revelation they had is now yours and you have ownership of the truth they had when they wrote the scriptures. Meditation is thinking and pondering and remembering and revolving your mind around the truth of the Word of God and what God says about you and what God says about who is in you, about your condition in Christ, your position in Christ. As you think about those things and your mind ponders it and reflects upon it, then what's in your heart begins to be released because faith is activated. The mind is renewed by meditation and when the mind is renewed by meditation, faith is activated. Faith is activated. Faith is that energy, that energizing effect of faith is activated as you begin to renew your mind. I talked about this also. James 1.21, our job is to plant the word into our heart. God's job is when the word is planted in our heart, God's job, God's work is to save your soul. See, your spirit has already been saved when you were born again. Your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions were not saved when you were born again. They are being saved. It's called sanctification. James 1.21 says, plant the word of God, plant the word of God into your heart that is able to save your soul. The Word of God has the power inside of it to save your soul. Think about that for a second. The, it's the effortless transformation. Now, it, now, now, getting there requires a lot of effort. It requires you to take time and discipline to meditate and plant the Word and study and ponder and get it inside of you. But when the Word of God gets inside of you, the Word of God itself does the work of transformation. The Word of God is able to save your soul. That's why biblical meditation is so vital. It's so important of just constantly thinking on and pondering the truth of God's Word because that Word has the power to save you. That word has, the Word of God has the power to do what you cannot do. Once it gets into your heart and begins to grow, there's no stopping it. And meditation and pondering helps get that word planted deep, deep inside of you so that you can make a shift from the flesh to the spirit by thinking different, renewing your mind, being transformed, experiencing the metamorphosis by that comes by renewing your mind. And then another, another thing we're gonna, we talked about a lot is Philemon 1.6, activate your faith. Philemon 1.6, where Paul said that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. That word actually means energized. It's like drinking your latte in the morning, your coffee in the morning. Your faith becomes energized. Your faith becomes effective. Your faith becomes activated. See, do you realize this? Your faith has to become activated every single day if you ever feel like you're in some kind of a funk, it's probably because your faith has not yet been activated. You have to activate your faith every day or your faith becomes, goes into still mode or quiet mode, pause mode, sleep mode, whatever you want to call it, like on a computer. And you have to activate your faith every day. And that's what Paul's talking about here that your faith may become activated, your faith may become energized. Well, how, Paul, does that happen? Through the knowledge, through the precise and exact knowledge, is what this Greek word means, the precise and exact knowledge of every good thing which is what? In you. Now, Paul's not talking about meditating on your best life now or meditating on, you know, how good you are in and of yourselves and the positive aspects of you and those kinds of things. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about the good things that are in you because Christ is in you. He's talking about meditate upon Jesus Christ who is in you. When's the last time you spent time meditating on who it is that dwells inside of you. What an incredible thing. I, I, we should never, ever get over the fact 
that Christ Jesus, by the Spirit of God, is in you. That is profound. That should never get old. And as you meditate on, on the good that's in you because of Christ and what he's done for you by the Spirit and transforming your spirit, that one-third of you is now righteous. One-third of you is now saved. One-third of you is complete. One-third of you is holy. One-third of you is sanctified. What God did for you when you were born again, we should never get over that as we meditate on who Christ is and what he's done and how he's joined my human spirit to his Holy Spirit, the union I have with Jesus Christ, thinking about that, meditating on that, pondering that, what happens is faith is activated. And when faith is activated, God begins to move. Just like the Gospels, God cannot move when we are not operating in faith. The Lord moves by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. God moves by faith. And as you renew your mind by meditation... And, you, and, your, and your mind comes into alignment with the thoughts of God as you renew your mind by meditation, and, and I'm talking about meditation in God's facts, what Jesus has already accomplished for you on the cross, meditation about what the Spirit has already accomplished in your human spirit. As you, as you put your faith in God's facts, and again, we're not talking about promises in this session, in this teaching, oh, that's very important. Promises for healing, breakthrough, finances, all that stuff. Relationships, those are all important. But what we're talking about now is faith in what God has already done. When your faith is, is activated in God's facts, what he's already done, that allows the indwelling Holy Spirit to make it real in your experience. See, how many of you want to go deeper in your experience of Christ? Well, we're meant to. This Christian life is not just to be an intellectual study of the Word of God. It's meant to be a living, breathing experience. And when your faith is activated by meditation on the good that is in you, then what happens is the Spirit of God, who always works by faith... From Genesis to Revelation, God moves by faith. God does not move by unbelief. God does not move by doubt. God moves when his people agree with him and have faith that God says, it says what he, will, he will do what he promised to do. And in this case, what God, we begin to believe what God has already done. Is this making sense? This, hopefully this is review. Some of you are looking at me like, I never heard this before. This is review from the, you can go back and listen to the last three sessions. But faith is the conduit through which grace flows. You are saved by, you are saved by grace through faith. And you're meant to walk by grace through faith every day of your life. We talked about grace. Grace is the power of God. Grace is the power of God that enables you to be who God calls you to be and to do what God calls you to do. And faith is the key that unlocks the grace of God for that power, that inward power of God to begin to flow through you. See, as your faith unlocks that power, God's grace, like a, like a channel, begins to flow into you, enabling you to be who God's called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. You have, you have all the grace of God available to you you will ever need to be exactly who God's called you to do or be and to do exactly what God's called you to do. Faith in those promises, faith in that reality unlocks the door to that grace so inward power can flow and bring forth transformation. See, Paul said in Ephesians that without faith, Christ cannot dwell in the heart. Christ dwells in the heart by faith. By faith. If you don't believe, even if, you're, even if your faith is in that, in that Paul's sleep mode that, that hasn't been activated, if you're not, if your faith, you know, just like a computer can go into sleep mode, your faith can go into sleep mode, and it needs that activation. If your faith is not activated, Christ, though he dwells in your spirit, is not dwelling in your heart. He's not 
fully filling your heart and living his life in you and through you. And so faith needs to be activated. And the, the next thing, just as a review, is we talked about, I think it may be in the last session, Mark 7, 21 through 23, you don't have to turn there, but just as a review, that Jesus said, from the heart of men come evil thoughts. See, thoughts are not, and we mentioned in one of the earlier sessions, thoughts come from several different sources, the body, the brain, the mind, the spirit, the heart from demons. But if you study the scriptures, there is, there is a clear heart-mind connection. You will never rise above what you believe in your heart. You will never rise above what you believe in your heart. If you, if you are not experiencing breakthrough in your relationship with Christ, if you're struggling with some battle in the flesh, whatever it could be, lust, jealousy, envy, <clears throat> anger, underneath that, underneath those thoughts, there are beliefs in your heart because with the heart, man believes Faith, belief, doubt, and unbelief are all issues of the heart. Underneath the engine, if, if you have these flood of thoughts, underneath the engine, there's something you are believing that's not in alignment with God's truth. It, there is a lie that you're believing, and the heart-mind connection is creating a flood of thoughts into your mind that's causing you to be in this state. The mind then influencing the emotions, the emotions influencing the will, all of that. And it comes down to what is it? What am I believing in my heart? We're going to get into that today. That's really where we're moving towards, this heart-mind connection. Um, and I just, want, just wanted to point that out. It's like, it's like being on autopilot. If you have a Tesla and you plug in, here's the destination I want to go. Take me there. And you say, okay, take me to my house. Plug in the coordinates. Your Tesla is going to drive by, on autopilot right to your house. Whatever's been pre-programmed into the car is the way it's going to take you. And, that, and, I, and heart beliefs, what we believe in our heart, we function on auto. A lot of us don't even realize this, but if you really, really break it down, we function on autopilot based upon the coordinates that have been pre-programmed in our heart. So whatever beliefs have been programmed, whatever lies, whatever thing we believe in our heart that has been programmed into us, we don't even realize it, but we're operating on autopilot based upon those predetermined beliefs and the way into a breakthrough and the way into a greater release of the life of Christ is to reprogram your heart beliefs and your mind by the word of God. And as you do that, as you begin to reach, change, and exchange the lie you have been believing for a truth, what begins to happen is you begin to experience the transformation, the metamorphosis, the metamorpho that Paul was talking about. Does that make sense? So in this set, that, that's all review. In this session, I, I want to talk about four principles of faith, because everything I've just talked about, faith, I, I don't know which is more important, renewing the mind or faith. They're, they're equally important because they go, they're intricately connected. But to live by the indwelling life of Christ, you, you can't do it without faith, and you can't do it with faith until your mind's been renewed. So I just want to talk about today four principles of faith that are related to living by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And so we'll, let's talk about the first one. Faith is an issue of the heart. Faith is not related to the brain or the mind. See, in this age in which we live in that idolizes knowledge, that idolizes the human brain, so many people have made the vital mistake of thinking that intellectualism or knowledge is the same thing as faith, and they're absolutely not the same thing. You, you, we, can have, we have churches filled today with unbelievers who are believing the facts about Jesus Christ, that he was born of a virgin, he did great miracles, he died and was resurrected. They believe those facts 
in their head, but in their heart, they have never been, uh, they don't believe it in their heart. It's not a faith issue, it's a mental issue. See, faith is an attitude of the heart. It's not a mental issue. And so just Romans 10.10, 10, Paul said that with the heart, a person believes. Where does a person believe? With the heart, not with the mind. Where does a person believe? With the heart. See, God is a heart God. God relates to us spirit to spirit, but he's a heart God. God wants, a, God wants your heart engaged, not just your mind, but your heart, not just intellectualism, but faith. It, it requires faith from beginning to end. In Acts 8.37, Philip turned to the Ethiopian eunuch and said, if you believe with all of your heart, you can be saved. Again, believing and faith are matters of the heart. Not only are believing and faith matters of the heart, but so is unbelief and doubt. In Luke 24.25 and Luke 24.38, these are all in the notes, Jesus rebuked his followers and said, Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe. They were slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Why do doubts arise in your heart? See, the heart is the place of faith. The heart is the place of believing. The heart is the place of doubt. The heart is the place of unbelief. And it's, it's with the heart that we relate to God. It's with the heart that God responds to. That's why in Hebrews 3.12 the writer of Hebrews says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. See, unbelief and faith go in the heart. So faith is an issue of the heart. Faith is not an issue of the mind. See, whatever you believe in your heart is going to bubble up into your thinking. And if you're believing lies, lies are going to dominate your thinking and determine whether you live in the spirit or whether you live in the flesh. So you've got to think about what you're thinking about. You've got to think about what you're thinking about. What are you thinking about? What thoughts dominate your mind? Because if you realize, if you start realizing, I'm struggling with these thoughts and I can't get victory over my thoughts... Nine times out of ten, there's something deeper inside of your heart you're believing. And it's just naturally bubbling up into your thinking patterns, and you cannot get victory over your thoughts. No matter what you do, these thoughts are just there, bouncing around and swirling in your mind. You're believing underneath the engine is something going on in your heart that you're believing. It's like the check engine light of your car, just these constant thoughts or like the check engine light of your car that says there's something underneath the hood that needs to be fixed. So if you begin to feel like, okay, these thoughts are dominating my mind, dominating my mind, whether it could be lust or anxiety or worry or rejection or self-hatred or inferiority, whatever it could be, a million different things, somewhere, not somewhere, here in your heart, there's some lie, there's something you're believing about yourself or believing about God or believing about your situation that's contrary to Scripture and that, that faith in the lie is actually empowering the thoughts to spring up into your mind and making your life a mess. And the key to victory then is to identify this is what I'm believing and this is the lie I'm believing. I've got to exchange that with the truth. And I'll share some examples here in a minute. Okay, make sense so far? Faith is an issue of the heart. Number two, another principle of faith is you live by, I live by, we live by, what, what you believe will bring you the most pleasure. You live by, what you believe will bring you the most pleasure. And I would encourage you to think this one through. Some people go, oh, that's not true. Think it through. You really want to live by what you think is going to bring you the most misery? <laughs> most people don't because God's designed the human heart in this way. And I'm going to explain this in a second. You live by what you believe will bring you the most pleasure. 
See, God designed the human heart after his own image. We were created in the image of God, like it talks about in Genesis. We were created in the image of God and in the likeness of God. God is a God of, God is a heart God. God is a God of desire. God is a God of passion. God is a God of desire. And he's created our hearts like his heart to be hearts driven by desire. You cannot turn desire off. And desire is not evil. Desire for wrong things, God forbids, is evil, but not desire in and of itself. Because God ultimately designed the human heart to find, to find satisfaction and pleasure in God. That's, he's the only one who can bring satisfaction. He's the only one that can bring true joy and happiness. God designed the human heart to be driven by desire. See, just like your natural physical heart pumps out blood to your arteries and to your veins, your heart is constantly, your, your immaterial heart is constantly pumping out desires. See, what, what blood is to the physical heart, desire is to the immaterial heart. And I just looked at the definition. Okay, what is desire? It's the conscious impulse towards something that promises enjoyment or satisfaction in its attainment. That's why I said that you will live by what you believe will bring you the most pleasure. God has created the human heart to live by desire. And if it's, if it's infected and affected by sin then we're going to try to find that uh, satisfaction and that joy in sin and what God forbids. But God has created the human heart to be driven by desire because God wants a relationship. God is a relational God. God is a bridegroom. And he wants a relationship. He does not want a robotic, pre-programmed, artificial intelligence creation that's operating based on his design that says, you know, we don't have free will. We're just going to do exactly what you say like a robot. No, God wants lovers. God wants a relationship. And because God wants a relationship with you, a real relationship with you, he's put in you a heart that is driven by desire. And the key to living by his life and living in holiness is not trying to suppress your desires, but turning your desires into what truly finds the most satisfaction, and that is in God himself. John Piper said that God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. I mean, some people think that God's glorified when we're bored in our relationship with him. We're like, this is so boring. And we think God's being glorified because we're going through some religious, boring activities and like we think we're glorifying God. That's, God's like, I'm not boring. If you're bored, something is amiss in your relationship because God who created the heavens and earth is not boring. And so God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. When you really realize that God is my satisfaction, God is my joy, God is my delight, then he is most glorified because it shows that he is the ultimate satisfaction of the human heart. The human heart, I think it was Augustine that said this, the human heart is restless until it finds its status or its rest in God. The human heart is restless until it finds its rest in God. See, God designed the human heart to be driven by desire. Try as you may to, supp to suppress this or not believe this, everything you do ultimately is driven by what you think is going to bring you the greatest satisfaction, pleasure, and happiness. Even sacrifices. Even Jesus was driven this way. Hebrews 12, 12 2. For the, uh, the writer of Hebrews said, for the, joy, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The cross you carry to crucify self ultimately is for a greater joy of finding a greater and deeper relationship with God that will give you greater satisfaction than anything else would. And therefore, you make sacrifices of what cannot truly satisfy for what can ultimately satisfy. That's desire. That's the heart. That's the heart and operation. God designed the human heart that way. So, I mean, just from the moment you begin to breathe and walk and talk, you realize the heart is driven by what it believes 
There is a faith aspect. What it believes will bring you the most pleasure. See, but a lot of Christians, a lot of, Christ, a lot of religious Christians, they try to avoid pleasure altogether, wrongly believing pleasure is evil. Again, pleasure is not evil. It's taking pleasure in what God forbids that's evil. See, a lot of Christians think like trying to obey God externally is like taking cough medicine or eating spam. It's just like this repulsive thing. We're, you know, we're going to try to obey God because he tells us to, but really deep down we hate it. That is not, that is not God's word. Sorry if I ruined your thinking about lunch, a spam sandwich for lunch. So I've never had spam, but it looks disgusting. If you like spam, I'm sorry, but I don't mean to offend you. But some people think that, you know, that this, like, this is like the way God is. And, you know, that if you, the way to please God is to like grin and bear it, behavior modification. We're going to try to suppress what we really want to do to, to obey this boring commandment that God gives us. That only lasts for like a month and you burn out. Because if the human heart is not finding the pleasure it longs for, and I'm talking about finding it in the Lord, then it will find pleasure in other things. And so when, when God's, the, the scriptures, God's commandments, God's commandments for righteousness, God's commandments for life, God's commandments for holiness, these, these are not intended to make you miserable. <laughs> these are intended to make you holy, and in holiness you find the ultimate joy you're really looking for because you find it in the Lord who is in his presence. There is fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. See, have you ever thought about, just, for, just on this, this, this topic of, of belief, your heart is driven by what you believe will bring you the most pleasure. Have you ever thought about what, have you ever really deconstructed sin and, to, and find out, okay, what, what really is sin? What really is sin? If you really deconstruct sin, you really find out sin is driven by a belief that, that is going, this sin is going to make me happy. You know, just think about, I mean, you know, if you ever get bored, go have a spam sandwich and think about deconstructing sin. It's probably not something on your, high on your to-do list, but think about, think about, for example, fornication or sexual sin. Is these two sins originate in the heart? In fact, Jesus talked about, let me actually read this scripture here. Mark 7, verse 21. Mark 7, verse 21. Jesus said, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts. So thoughts come from the heart. Fornication, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. And so you could just go down that list and think about, okay, what those sins come out of the heart. What really in deconstructing those sins, what really is it that's driving those sins? Adultery or sexual sin is the heart belief that's, that thinks, I'm going to find satisfaction and pleasure in, in this forbidden act of adultery or, or fornication or pornography. It's this belief that says, I'm going to find satisfaction in this. What is it driven by? It's driven by a heart belief trying to find satisfaction. Think about uh, theft. Is this a heart belief that says, I'm going to find satisfaction by taking what belongs to someone else so I can have it and I then will hopefully be more happy? I mean, again, you can just think about it. Coveting. What is coveting? Coveting is wanting something bigger and better that someone else has because you believe in your heart that if you have what they have, you will find joy and happiness. See, you just break, them all, break sin down. It really is, boils down to what you believe in your heart will bring you the greatest pleasure. Or think about pride. Pride is the heart belief that you would experience greater pleasure if people begin to praise you for your gifts and your talents and your opinions 
and how great you are, how beautiful you are, and you think that I'm going to have joy, true joy and happiness because people are praising me for some trait or quality that I have. Again, that pride is driven by this heart belief that I'm going to find ultimate satisfaction and joy. So, I mean, I'm not going to go through every single thing on this list. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm saying. If, if sin is rooted in the heart belief that these things forbidden by God is going to bring us ultimate pleasure, then I'm going to also say holiness is also rooted in the belief that God himself is going to bring us the ultimate pleasure. And we fight sin by realizing these things don't ultimately satisfy us, but God himself, in whom there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, is the one who can and does ultimately satisfy the human heart. And when he satisfies the human heart, I don't need anything else but him. Living like that, is the key to holiness. It's what people have called happy holiness. That happy holiness. Jesus was a happy, holy man. It talks about in Hebrews that, that he, hated right, he hated lawlessness and he loved righteousness. Therefore, God anointed him with the oil of gladness above his companions. See, if, you're, if you think you're walking in holiness and you don't have in, increasing joy and pleasure, it's probably more religion you're walking in than true, authentic holiness. Because God is a God of pleasure. God is a God of joy. God is a God of happiness. And so as, as his life is translated to you, you begin to experience the fullness of joy and the pleasures forevermore. You think about this when Jesus was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. It's a paradigm shift for us. Because so much of the church is trying to appeal to this innate desire in the human heart that, that wants pleasure and wants to be happy in all the wrong ways. You know, and they're preaching a message of your best life now. I've had your best life now for a while, I mean for a season, and it doesn't satisfy quite even close to what God does. So preachers are out there preaching your best life now. When Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you if you're meek. Blessed are you if you're pure of heart. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Blessed are you if you show mercy. And he went through the, the eight Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. That word blessed in the Greek actually means happy. And so the Lord was not giving us a, a like cough medicine, take this medicine and you're going to feel better. He was actually telling you if you really want to be happy in your life, Hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you really want to be happy and joyful in your life, develop a meek heart. If you really want to be happy in your life, endure persecution. If you really want to be happy in your life, then show mercy. Don't judge. The, the list goes on and on. So I'm convinced that we will never have this true holiness that comes from God in God until we find our ultimate satisfaction in him. Happy holiness. Happy holiness that comes from finding our ultimate pleasure in God himself. That's why David said, you will give me a drink from the river of your pleasures. The river that was flowing, the spiritual river that was flowing in the Ark of the Covenant when David was worshiping, as he was worshiping before the very glory of God, that river, that spiritual river, the Holy Spirit's river was called the river of pleasure, the river of delights. God wants to delight your heart in him. And when you delight your heart in him and he's your first love and you find your pleasure in him and you find your pleasure in the truth of his word, what happens is you begin to walk in holiness and in purity and it's not the boring pharisaical, religious kind of purity or holiness, which actually Jesus said, you are whitewashed tombs. You are full of dead men's bones. On the outside, you're clean, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Happy holiness is a delight in God that God is my joy. God is my pleasure. God is the ultimate one that satisfies my heart. So you and me no matter how hard we try, are driven by what we believe will bring us the most pleasure. And, it's, and God has designed us that way so that we would be people 
who find our pleasure in him. In him. God does not want us to be bored, unhappy Christians getting by, taking our spam sandwich and our cough medicine, but we're walking in holiness. That's more religion. Now, that's better than disobedience, but there's a much better way of happy holiness, of finding our delight in him in a relationship with the Lord. Okay, number three is right believing leads to right living. Right believing leads to right living. When you believe right, you will live right. When you believe wrong, you will live wrong. That's why Solomon said in Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence because from it flows the issues of life. The heart is everything. Watch over your heart. Every single person in this life is driven by what they believe. Whether they are a missionary in the Middle East or an atheist in a liberal college, they are driven by what they believe in their heart. That's the way God designed the human heart, we, to, to operate by that, those heart beliefs so that we would be his disciples and we would be his, those in a relationship with him. And so as we talk about as we talk about faith, as we talk about living by the indwelling life of Christ, as we talk about how to have more of his life flowing out of us, faith is that key because we're, go we're going to live by faith. Every single person, even the atheist lives in faith. They, they live by faith in a God who they don't think exists. Every single person, by God's design, going back to Genesis chapter 1, lives by what they believe. Every single person, even those who are unbelievers, live by what they believe. And so we are going, and so if we're going to live by his indwelling life, we've got to come into alignment with this law of faith. The way God designed the human heart was to live by faith, was to live by what we believe. And so if, if we're going to have faith in something or someone, why not have the fullness of faith in Jesus Christ and allow his life to then be released in us and through us? See, faith always comes before obedience. Faith always comes before obedience. You cannot obey your way into faith. But you can believe your way into obedience. That's why Paul said, he called it, the obedience of faith. When you try to obey your way into faith, you do exactly what the Pharisees did. They tried to believe their way. Now, again, this, again is, this is much better than disobedience. But God wants us to live by faith, and that faith produces works, like James talked about. Faith without works is dead. True faith always produces obedience. But if you try to obey your way into faith, it can actually produce legalism. See, faith produces obedience. If you want to obey God better, believe God better. If you want to enhance your obedience, learn to believe better rather than just trying harder. You see, the obedience comes out of faith. Obedience comes out of faith. So Jesus talked about this in John, or in John 3, 36. So I want you to just to kind of see the, the connection here between belief and obedience. He who believes, John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The fruit of faith is obedience. If you believe right, you will live right. If you believe wrong, you will live wrong. I mean, this is really, really simple. But obedience is the fruit of faith. Faith is not the fruit of obedience. It's very important we get that right. If you get that and out of order, you're going to be messed up. Faith produces obedience. 
I've got a couple slides here to show, just a couple quotes, just to reinforce this. A.W. Tozer, let's see if we have it showing. We do, cool. A.W. Tozer said, the man that believes will obey. Failure to obey is convincing proof that there is no true faith present. Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, only he who believes is obedient. And only he who is obedient believes. So, believing, faith leads to obedience. Faith produces obedience. Obedience is the fruit of faith. When your heart has fully been persuaded by the truth, obedience is the natural result. Because when your heart trusts the truth, the mind justifies it, the emotions uh, desire it, and the will executes it. And so right believing produces right living. Everything in your life follows your heart. And so if you're struggling with something, whether it could be a million things, if you're struggling with something and you're, you're, you're dominated by, I don't know, rejection or unworthiness or worry or lust or guilt or coveting or whatever it could be, what is happening is there's somewhere in your heart where you're not believing the truth of God's word and what God says about you. And if you want to change your life, don't begin by changing the external things. If you're living in sin, obviously change that. I don't mean stay in sin. But what I'm saying is if you really want to change your life, work on examining what is it that I'm believing in my heart that's driving my thoughts. Those thoughts are driving my actions. Those actions are driving what I do, driving and forming my character, forming and even producing my destiny. <clears throat> See, behavior modification does not change the human heart. Only the Spirit of God and the Word of God can change the human heart. Trying harder without developing better beliefs is only going to lead to burnout. You've got to believe better rather than just trying harder. See, external, now again, external compliance to God's commandments is better than disobedience. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But external compliance to God's commandments through teeth, teeth gritting obedience or teeth gritting determination does not transform you into his image. Dallas Willard said, You can live opposite of what you profess, but you cannot live opposite of what you believe. You are what you believe. What you do in this life, the fruit of your life, is the fruit of what you believe. So if you want to see greater transformation and greater change, if you want the life of Christ to be great released through you, if you want to do what God's called you to do and be who God's called you to be, it begins by examining your beliefs in your heart. Lord, what is it that I'm believing? Or what, what lies am I believing? What lies am I believing about you? What lies am I believing about others? And, and you know, confronting those lies with the truth of God's word and reshaping your mind. And I'm going to give a lot of examples uh, in, an, in an, one of the next sessions. You know, with coveting or with lust or whatever. Reshaping your heart beliefs based on God's truth so that you can live different. George MacDonald, a, a Scottish minister in the 1800s, said, a man's real belief is that which he lives by. A man believes, what a man believes is the thing he does, not the thing he thinks. And this is true for the Christian, the Muslim, this is true for the Jew, this is true for the atheist. Every single person lives by what they believe. And so you, you see what I'm saying? This is so important that we, we really think about what we believe. We really think about these heart beliefs that are forming our thinking and forming our actions. See, what you believe, number four, what you believe ultimately shapes your destiny. Not only your destiny in this life, but your destiny forever. Proverbs 23, verse 7 says that 
as a man, as he thinks in his heart, I'm quoting the New King James Version, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You are, I am, a composite of what we believe in our heart. It's kind of challenging. It's like, oh man, who we are, who we become, all that we do stem from what we believe in our heart. Are we believing the truth of God's word? Are we believing a lie? It really, life is really, you know, life is so complicated, but it really is so simple. God has designed the human heart to be driven by what it believes. And, and what we, whether we believe a lie or whether we believe a truth or whether we believe some lies and whether we believe some truths, all that composite, all those heart beliefs shape and form us into who we are. As a man, as a woman thinks in their heart, as a person believes in their heart, so they are. So if you want transformation, it begins by meditation. It begins by changing your heart. See, me, the, there's a heart-mind connection. When you begin to meditate, it not only changes your thinking, but it does change your heart. When you begin to meditate, it begins to plant God's Word into your heart. And when God's Word gets into your heart, your thinking begins to change. And when your thinking begins to change, your actions begin to change. And when your actions begin to change, your character begins to change. And when your character begins to change, your destiny begins to change. It really is so important. I, I've got another slide on here. Just that the, the, um, the arrow pointing up, the blue slide is beliefs inspire thoughts. Thoughts inspire actions. Actions establish habits. Habits produce character. And character determines destiny. A lot of us were operating on autopilot with pre programmed coordinates that have been placed inside of us even when we were young. And as we went through situations growing up, there are heart beliefs we don't even know exist. But we're, we're living on autopilot from those heart beliefs that have been established within us, and we're moving in, in, in exactly the direction those heart beliefs are projecting us. And we're like, well, we can't get off this trail. You, that's right, you can't. You're on autopilot programmed exactly to where you believe. So if you want to see change, if you want to see transformation, you've got to begin to change the, think, the, the beliefs that are inspiring the thoughts. And then those thoughts begin to change that are inspiring the habits and the character. you got to start with the heart beliefs um, to, to really see that transformation. J just, just to give you some examples, okay? And I, I'm gonna, in, the next, in the next teaching, I'm going to give a lot more examples. But the next teaching is, let, let's say you struggle with uh, low self-esteem or unworthiness. And you're always just thinking about, okay, I'm not attractive, or I'm unworthy, or nobody likes me, or God's mad at me, I'm a hopeless hypocrite, I'm never going to amount to anything. You know, it could be a million different expressions of that, and you, you, you struggle with these thoughts of inferiority and insecurity and stuff like that. Whatever, it could be a million things of why you struggle with it. Well, I, I, you know, at the very surface of it, at the very, at the very depth of it, I mean, the very depth of it, it comes down to this, is that you don't understand and know and you have not experienced in the, in the greatest way you can experience the love of God. Because when God's love washes over you and God's love immerses you and God's love baptizes you with his incredible, overwhelming love, it drives out fear. It drives out rejection. It drives out inferiority. It drives out guilt, shame, and condemnation. When you understand the cross and, what, and that, you, that Jesus Christ died for you and he shed his blood on the cross for you and that he is, you know, this is not just some theological theory that scholars who smoke pipes and wear jackets talk about in a library. This is real. This is like in your everyday life. When you understand 
that this is true about you. God loves you and you experience it. You don't just know it. You experience it and the waves of love crash over you and wash over you and you realize that I am God's beloved. I am his chosen one in Christ. I am beloved and chosen. He loves me. He says to me, you are the one I have chosen. He says there is no shame and no guilt. I have forgiven you of your sins and you are justified and you are righteous. Who will condemn God's elect? There is no one in heaven and earth that will condemn God's elect. God is the one who justifies. Where is he who condemns? When you understand God's love for you, it shatters and drives out that inferiority because you begin to believe, I am not this inferior person. You begin to believe God, the creator of the universe, loves me, and because he loves me, therefore, I am successful. Therefore, I am chosen. And it doesn't matter if anyone else chooses me. I am chosen in Christ. And the guilt and the shame and the inferiority is driven out. If you struggle with anxiety and your mind is bombarded with, will I have enough money to make ends meet? What will happen in the world and in my country? Will my children grow up to love God? Will I live to see my grandchildren? Will I pass my exams at school? Whatever, it could be a million things we all struggle. We all have these anxieties we struggle with. Boiling it down, getting down to the heart is do we trust God to be our provider? To be the one, like he talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. Take no thought for your life, what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what, what clothes you're going to put on. Now, this is easier said than done, obviously, but, you know, when you get into the heat of the battle and you're, fi you're finding these tests and you're in this warfare and all this, it's easier said than done. It's easier to preach a sermon about it than to live it, but it's still the truth is that down deep in our heart, God is the provider. God is, if, if God spoke this universe into creation by just mere words, he can bring a breakthrough into your situation. God can bring healing where there's a physical uh, ailment. God can bring breakthrough where you need finances. God can bring breakthrough in relationships. Putting your trust and your belief and to say, God is my provider. God is the one who will bring a breakthrough. Putting your trust in him rather than in circumstances, believing that God will bring that breakthrough changes your thinking and you have peace that he is watching over every single thing in your life. And he loves you and there is nothing that can separate you from him. See, you, you could just go, I'm going to go into these, I'm going to go into a list, a lot more examples in the next, next two sessions here. But to, to really get off the autopilot you've got to begin to really identify what is my struggle? What, what beliefs am I believing? What lies am I believing? What things am I putting my faith in? Because you're putting in faith in lies. Am I putting my faith in lies or in truth? You're putting your belief in either in the lies or in the truth. What are these things you're believing? What are these things, your lies or truth, and, and really identifying these, writing them down, and then confronting them with the truth, getting that truth in your heart so you can pre reprogram the way you were pre-programmed so you can get to your ultimate destination of where God wants you to be. And so as we bring this to a close, I just want to say this. The only way to lasting change is to believe better who God is what he has done for you in Christ and what he has done and is, and is doing in you by his spirit. When you believe him and you believe his facts and you believe his promises, when your faith comes into alignment with God's truth, you will begin to see breakthrough and liberty because Jesus said that, that the truth will make you free. The truth makes you free. Believing the truth sets you free from whatever it is that has bombarded your mind and held you captive for, for years and years and years, the truth sets you free. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Father, for the law of faith. Thank you, Father, for the law of faith. Thank you, Lord, that, Lord, 
the way you have made us in your design to live by faith, I'm asking you, Lord, to begin to reveal to us what lies are we believing that are limiting you from moving, that are limiting you from acting, that are hindering us from receiving, that are ultimately, as we're talking about in this, this class, that's, that's hindering the release of the Spirit from flowing out of us like a mighty river of life. Lord, I'm praying, Lord, that you would begin to set people free in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The truth sets you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus, I just pray that you would begin to shine into the light of every single person, Lord, who's listening. Lord, the beliefs that people have aligned their, their hearts to that are keeping them in bondage because of believing lies. And you would liberate them by believing the truth of your word and how you feel about them. Lord, I'm praying for that in the mighty name of Jesus. Just set people free. Lord, we ask you in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray right now that you would fill everyone who's listening, who's hungry. You would fill us with your beautiful, glorious Holy Spirit, the life of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 We're going to end the online here. All righty. So that's all I have. Did you want to say some other stuff about the golf tournament? I know, I'm joking, more of an associate now. Um, all right, well, the golf tournament. I want to just uh, talk about a few logistical uh, things. I have four things, and I know uh, I'll be really, really quick. And then after this, if we could meet right over here with uh, everybody who's playing golf in the tournament and all those who are going to be working administratively, uh, just meet with me and Heather just for a few minutes uh, there. Okay, a couple things, four things. Uh, one, number one, pray about what would ha God would have you to give uh, and just pray and obey uh, and uh, just, you know, whatever the Lord puts in your heart. It can be either a pledge or it can be a gift or a combination uh, of the two. Um, the, the budget we set for the tournament is, uh, is 60000 and. Uh, I, don't, I haven't looked recently exactly where we were. The last time I looked, we were about 15,000, I think. So. 18,000 now, okay. Okay, all right, so yeah. So we're, we're getting there. Um, so uh, pray about that. Also, uh, if you feel comfortable, and I hope you will, reach out to those a few people and just tell them that you know, we're trying to raise funds for uh, our ministry in Africa, and we have a golf tournament. Would you uh, be willing to participate and support it? And, uh, and you can get, send them the online link, or you can send them the address where they can give online. And so, you know, I just do it by email with no pressure kind of a thing. And it's really, I've never had anybody uh, say, you know, they always say, wow, this is great that you're doing this, you know, and they, not all of them give, but it's easy to, to do that. So anyway, I would really encourage you to do that. Uh, it's the second thing. Uh, the third thing is that we do usually give gift cards or other prizes for like first place team, second place team, longest drive, long, uh, closest to the pin, things like that. So we usually give gift cards for those and, uh, 
If you can, if you have any today, give them to Heather. Uh, did you get any uh, gift cards today, Heather? You did, okay, good, good. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to do that and would like to, I'm not sure how many more we need, but I think that we need about 11 or 12 gift cards to be able to, to, to fund the prizes and things like that. So uh, anyway, you can uh, give one of those, 